Can you see me? Yes, I can see you. Great. It's better with this or? Uh, hello, Frederico, you okay? What, what do you prefer? With the mic? I think with the, uh, with the mic. Uh, otherwise, we are not hearing you. Hello, Mr. Yeah, hi, hi, okay? hi, hi. Oh, very well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you too. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. I didn't know I did the tie. Uh huh. <laughs> you are French, you can get away with anything. Good. I think we are almost on time, I think. I got three minutes. And I cannot share my screen. Yes, uh, let me just. Uh, uh, okay. You should be able to share your screen now, um, Federico. Can I share? Please, thanks. Is it okay? Yes, great. So we'll just wait for a couple of more minutes. Oh, don't worry. Hello, Martin. Uh, Hi, Niren. Hello. Hello, Martin. Great to have you. Thank you. Excellent. Just see the LCC here. Greetings, Frederick. Oh, fantastic. Hello. Hello, Frederick. Hello, everybody. Good. Excellent. So I think we are all on time. Just one minute and then. I shall introduce you and uh, uh, Naren, can you send a link to Nelsie? She's asking for. Um, okay, just a second. I'm going to start the meeting, um, um, Federico, you are ready? Yes, I'm here. Okay, ready? I'm great. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Penny Facial uh, Surgery Masterclass. We have the honor of uh, having a lecture on sagittal craniosynostosis from Professor Federico Di Rocco from Lyon. He has a vast experience having worked in Mecca and now in uh, Lyon. And uh, he is active in uh, not only his clinical work, but re uh, research with over 160 papers, as well as, as most of you in pediatric neurosurgery will know, in uh, education, particularly with EANS now with ISPN. I so have a uh, we are going to have a lecture on sagittal craniosynostosis, which is the commonest but also most controversial. And um, I'm eagerly looking forward to this lecture. And we have got uh, three faculty members who are going to uh, uh, help us discuss uh, at the end of the uh, lecture, as well as then I'll open the questions to the um, to the participants. We have got three eminent uh, craniofacial surgeons, Mr. Martin Evans, uh, the clinical lead of craniofacial surgery at the supra-regional Birmingham Craniofacial Center, and uh, Professor Nelsie Zanon, uh, who is the uh, chairman of the WFNS Pediatric Neurosurgery Committee, and Dr. Uday Kumar, Dr. Suhas Uday Kumaran, uh, professor 
and consultant at the Amitra Institute in Cochin, Kerala. So without further ado, uh, I will ask Professor D. Rocco to start this meeting. If everyone in, during the time, including me, uh, keep the um, microphone mute, I'll be grateful. Thank you, Federico. Thank you, thank you, Noren. Thank you for this uh, very uh, prestigious invitation. It's a pleasure for me to discuss uh, here the, the topic we uh, dis uh, discussed together, the sagittal synostosis, because as you mentioned, it's the very common but still controversial uh, type of synostosis. And I'm uh, very happy to be here with friends to discuss about this topic, and I'm uh, eager to hear their comments and share opinions. So sagittal synostosis, as we said, is the most common type of synostosis. Half of the cases of synostosis are of the sagittal suture. And uh, there has been a tremendous amount of work uh, on this type of synostosis. You see uh, that there have been like, exponential uh, publications in uh, this field in the last years. And you see that 2021 already started very well on this uh, topic. So why the sagittal synostosis, which everybody thinks, uh, well, it's uh, something that we know, something that is common and something we already have seen and uh, we can uh, manage without problems. Well, the reason uh, uh, we decided to start with the sagittal synostosis with Naren is because there are a lot of controversies. And actually, if you go in depth in this type of synostosis, we see that there is no such a thing like a scaphocephaly. We're talking about a very heterogeneous group of patients. It's an heterogeneous condition. And all the controversies will come from this heterogeneity. Why it is heterogeneous? Because though we are talking about the same closure of the sagittal suture, there are a lot of different shapes in the skull that you can see after the closure difference in shape according to the sequence in time of the closure of the suture, and sometimes different degrees of closure. Like, you, like in the example here, you can have complete closure and you can have partial closure with the sagittal sinus going inside and you or only partially fused sutures. And this will give different shapes, different types of heads that define different subtypes from the morphological point of view. And the measures we usually use, which is the cranial index to classify to, uh, this type of uh, deformation, as you can easily understand, is uh, underestimating the variability that we can have in this type of deformation. The cranial index will be the same if the deformation is more anterior, most posterior with an anterior bossing or posterior bossing, and you will miss all the uh, subtle changes that the skull undergoes. And to show you some uh, changes, if you don't measure them, you will not understand how the changes can also affect the rest of the face with changes in the nasofrontal angle. And you can see quite easily in these two types of synostosis that despite the same closure of the sagittal suture, the changes affecting the skull and the uh, skull base are extremely different. So it's heterogeneous, but it's heterogeneous not only on the skull, also on the content. If you go and see what happens inside, there are changes that affect the brain, but also the CSF spaces. In some cases, you have very small uh, pericerebral spaces. In other cases, you have enlarged spaces with large ventricles that can be measured. And if you measure them, you will see that there are patients in which the pericerebral spaces are very large and children that have pericerebral spaces that are below what is the estimate norm for their age. Same thing for the ventricles. You see that there are different groups with large ventricles and those the ventricles are very small. So there are differences also in the content. And the different are also, as we said, on the suture itself with different type of shapes of this uh, fusion of the suture over the sagittal sinus, and maybe this also explain the differences in the CSF resorption, because we have a situation in which the uh, superior sagittal sinus is completely encased inside the uh, 
bone and compress and it has no place for the uh, normal uh, pulsated elasticity that we can observe. And when we see uh, if this, there is a correlation, the, there is a correlation between those who have the uh, deformity and the uh, on the over the sinus and the cerebral effusion of CSF. So probably there is at least there is a statistical correlation. Probably there is also a physiopathological explanation with a, a worst CSF resorption in those cases. So. Clearly, there are some subgroups of scaphocephaly. There are different types that we have to take uh, into account. Of course, it is also heterogeneous because there are different backgrounds. We have genetic backgrounds. We all know that we can have familiar cases. It's rare yet, it's still 6 to 10%. It can affect twins, but not, of course, 100%. So we know that there is a big specific background. And we know also that sometimes this background can be come over so during time that we can all have seen uh, children coming for escaphocephaly that actually were cruz on at the time and the genetic testing confirmed that there was an FHFR mutation underneath. But there are lots of other type of alteration that can be associated to a scaphocephaly or to a loss of the sagittal suture, to be more precise, that we can see in metabolic diseases. Uh, we can see in hypothyroidism, in pseudohypoparathyroidism, mucoplasacaridosis, and different mutation can lead to a premature fusion of the sagittal suture. Uh, in coelopathy, also, we can have, among other things, the loss of the sagittal suture. Uh, they are accompanied by ectodermal connective problems, heart uh, problems, renal and liver anomalies. So there can be an underlying syndrome in scaphocephaly, and the more we know the, the different conditions, the more we are able to recognize what are the syndromes that are behind it. So this is to illustrate that there are some limits to uh, the phenotype strategy that we usually use in synostosis, in which we say, okay, the suture is closed, Head is elongated, there is a scaphocephaly, and we stop there the uh, explanation. This is only the phenotypic description, but when we go to the genes or to the other abnormalities, we can dig uh, further, we find other things. So it's very important for the patient that the child is seen in a multidisciplinary clinic uh, that is uh, searching for all the other anomalies that can be related to these skeletal disorders. This is an example to explain why this is not anecdotal, but it's important for the child. This is a uh, patient was operated on for a simple uh, scaphocephaly uh, by a very a famous uh, uh, surgeon, uh, very well operated on, but the surgeon didn't care to examine the toes of the child. It was already a syndactyly that should have uh, drew his attention. And then uh, he was lost in follow-up because after three years after surgery, everything was fine from the skull point of view. And then his underlying disease, which was a stenson brennan uh, syndrome, was diagnosed only 12 years later when he came back with uh, almost a terminal kidney uh, disease. So uh, you see that the delay in the diagnosis of the underlying syndrome was problematic. So we have in this type of uh, bone disease, the risk of having sometimes a delayed diagnosis of the underlying syndrome. In some cases, we have first the diagnosis of craniosynostosis, and only later the underlying disease is recognized. And this is a delay for the, uh, can be problematic as we have seen. And in other cases, the other way around, the, the, the bone disease, the bony disease is on, uh, recognized, but not the associated synostosis. And this is also a problem. If we miss the underlying diagnosis, as you have seen, it can be a problem for the heart, the kidney, and uh, other uh, organs. And we have, lot of genes that can be uh, in, in our uh, play a role. But on, on the other way around, if we miss the, uh, uh, the craniosynostosis, and uh, we can also have problems. Why it is important to understand the underlying disorder? And again, it is because it has an impact for the child. We've seen the example of the sense and brainer, but we also know that there are some mut uh, mutation in SMAD genes, in ZIG genes that can affect the, the skull, this uh, sagittal synostosis, but also the function of the brain, and they can predict problems in the outcome, in the cognitive outcome. So it is essential that these are recognized early for a proper 
treatment. And of course, this will hinder the, the results of our analysis. And again, this is the problem for the heterogeneity of the background of children with cavocephaly. When the uh, underlying syndrome is recognized, but not the scaphocephaly, the problem is sometimes that the symptoms the children can have can uh, be uh, related only to the disease, and, and the problem related to the synostosis might be misdiagnosed. This is an example of a metabolic synostosis with a, a X linked hypophosphatemia. You see that the deformation is very mild, still, the uh, sagittal suture is lost, the skull is thick, and you see also the tonsils can be quite low. And the child was symptomatic and relieved by the surgery. So I wanted to stress that sagittal suture close not always leads to a scaphocephaly. From a, the morphological point of view, it's not scaphocephalic, there is no dolicocephaly, but still there is a loss of the sagittal suture and there are symptoms related to the increase in trochanal pressure, there is papilledema, and there are headaches that are solved by a decompression which is a purely functional decompression. Again, there is no morphological uh, stay in a, a issue. So this is to uh, underline that the degree of morphological deformation in scaphocephaly and sagittal suture fusion is not a marker of functional severity. And this, again, underlines the lack of markers we have, because again, we function with the cranial index, which is a very poor index, and even that there is no correlation between this index and the, uh, the severity of the uh, deformation. So, uh, such synostosis is also heterogeneous because of the different ages of the child that we see. Uh, we can have uh, a child that with an antenatal diagnosis, uh, we can have children of different age that come to our uh, uh, clinic and different ages, of course, with different risk for the brain, different stage of development for the brain with different consequences from the cognitive point of view. So as you've seen, it's a very heterogeneous condition. Heterogeneous condition, but also heterogeneous management. As you know, there are different types of techniques. I didn't count all of them, but there are a dozen of different techniques using hardware or using a different type of osteotomies with all the different uh, things that the human imagination can uh, have. I think there are as many techniques as uh, surgical schools, and sometimes they appear like they are in conflict, uh, that they are uh, not using the same strategies. The, uh, the confusing terminology also plays a role in this heterogeneity because we have situations in which pay, uh, people call a strict craniectomy uh, the, uh, a surgery that others will call in another way, especially in cases in which we discuss of extended strip craniectomy or vault cranioplasty. Sometimes these uh, surgeries are similar. And so there is this uh, problem of the uh, confusing terminology, which increases the misunderstanding be, uh, when analyzing the results of what we are, we are doing. This is an example. You see uh, there is a large opening with barrel staving. We, uh, there is a removal of complete of the bone, which is on, only placed back to cover and, uh, the, uh, the dura. Is this not much more different in terms of extension of the osteotomies to something done later on in an older child? So this also confusion exists because of this problem in terminology, which would need a proper uh, description. You see that the confusing terminology also uh, is seen in the books. This is a picture taken from a description of the P-technique and you see that the suture was actually patent in the drawing. So you see that the confusion sometimes goes uh, very far. The P technique was considered for a long time the reference technique in the uh, treatment of scaphocephaly. But when you think about the description of the P technique, the, uh, we want to increase the pressure of the sinus. There is no liberation of the sagittal sinus. There is only this enlarge, lateral enlargement. So this was a technique that 
would have only a cosmetic uh, role without reducing the, pro the pressure uh, and actually increasing the pressure over the sagittal sinuses. And you have seen uh, on the images I've shown at the beginning how these uh, sagittal sinus can be encased into the bone. And so it can uh, lead to uh, the surge or to uh, increase even more the pressure over the sagittal sinus, the bed of venous outflow and uh, the suture over the dura to uh, reduce the anterior posterior diameter could also increase the uh, pressure of the child. So there is no, uh, no surprise in seeing that the uh, cognitive and the pressure results after this type of surgery were not better than that of the natural history. And this, of course, participate to the confusion or in the management of the patient with scaphocephaly. So the question, what are the goals of the surgery in scaphocephaly? And we just want to have kind of P correction, enlarging the lateral diameter, or do we aim to avoid the cerebral compression, to, cor uh, to correct the progression of the anomalies and to achieve a good cognitive outcome, the better cognitive outcome. And this is where all the controversies are, uh, because we have the confusion between what are the indications and what are the methods? Of course, we cannot discuss what is the best method if we don't agree on what is the objective we want to achieve. All the different techniques and papers you have seen mostly discuss about the methodology, open versus uh, closed, endoscopic, spring, all these different techniques. They are evaluated in terms of morbidity and mortality, but not on the uh, actual indication and objective we want to achieve in this gene. So we discuss about these different techniques because we know there are surgical risk in the correction of sagittal synostosis, like in all the other type of synostosis. There is a problem of blood loss in children with a small weight. There are lengthy operation, there can be collection. There is long hospital stays. There are non-cosmetic scars. And for all these reasons, different techniques have been developed in the last years to try to reduce these risks, starting from the endoscopies, the using of hardware like springs or distractors, or using uh, tailored minimal invasive uh, uh, cuts. All these techniques have the same goal, which is to try to reduce the morbidity. And you see this an example of a spring mediated reshaping, which you would place two springs to push uh, the parietal bones laterally. And you see all that the criteria that are used to analyze the expansion and the results are the blood transfusion rates, the main hospital stays, and the cost, which are, of course, important, but not essential if we compare to what is the indication for these children and why we're doing the surgery. Uh, these structures are also used in limited series. Of course, every time you use hardware, you need to place it and you have to remove it. So there is an increase in numbers of surgery. Uh, uh, but you see that again, what is uh, calculated is the analyze, is the operation duration, the anesthesia, the transfusion, and what can be the complication of the technique. The same for the, uh, the different uh, tailored uh, small scar incisions. The, uh, the analysis is mainly on the cosmesis and the transfusion rate on compli uh, or complication of the technique with the duration on a postoperative stay of the uh, patient. The same for the uh, helmet but, uh, and the, after the endoscopic surgery. So we have smaller incision, less blood losses, shorter operation, shorter lengths of stay and decreased cost. This has also been discussed. We know that uh, different series are compared and normally you compare the older traditional series to modern series. So actually the comparison is not completely uh, strict because there are different periods of time that are compared, different anesthesiological techniques, different patients, because usually the open technique are for older children are minimally invasive for the younger one. But still, what I wanted to stress is that we're comparing different situations, different periods, and uh, different techniques with the wrong criteria. Because we are using criteria only for the technique, but we don't assess what, again, the aim and why we were doing the surgery, what was the indication. This is due because we have a lack of criteria to analyze the, our results. So what criteria do we have? We 
will see the patient coming in our clinic after having been operated on for a scaphocephaly. And in most of the cases, we are the own judge of our own work. We want to say, oh, it was a good result, or in this case, it's not a good result. So it really depends on how we see ourselves and are we really objective or are always uh, we objective. It also depends on the mood of the day, on what happened the day before, and so on. And also, there is a problem that we don't actually know what is normal. So we uh, like to say we normalize the skull growth and the growth of the child, but we don't actually have the normal uh, norms to uh, come say that from a scientific point of view. So how we evaluate our surgical results? In most of the cases, we ask the patient if he's old enough or the parents, are you happy? What do you think? What do uh, our fellow, our colleagues say? Uh, and sometimes we ask, how is he doing at school? What do you think? Uh, the teacher is he happy or so on. So as you see, uh, most of the cases, it's a very limited uh, evaluation uh, that has no much scientific value. We can have all other uh, art criteria. We've seen in the paper, the cranial index, the subjective scales, the duration of surgery, transfusion, the morbidity, and the length of stay, the cost. All these criteria are regularly used describing different techniques. But if we focus again only on these uh, uh, criteria, and I want to be provocative on purpose, if these were to be the criteria for to decide what to do with this patient, the best would be to do nothing, just put an helmet. We know that the helmet will change the cranial index, will improve the cranial index. This has been shown. So we can reshape the head without surgery, and we will have a good cranial index, no scar, no surgery, no transfusion, no mortality, uh, uh, no uh, hospital stay, limited cost, and everybody will be happy. So again, I don't think this should be the criteria to focus in our research, in our papers, but we need to think why we're doing the surgery. So what are the res functional results of our surgery? And unfortunately, if you see the most of the paper, the, the, the results are only analyzed on subjective scales and cranial index. So what about these long-term results from a functional point of view, from the neurosurgical point of view? Because again, we are neurosurgeons, so what happens to the brain? Well, there is a risk of secondary synostosis. We have a risk of CP. We know that. We know that there is a risk of bad neuropsychological outcome. Again, also depending on the underlying uh, condition. This uh, risk of synostosis exists whatever the technique we do with the endoscopy, uh, with the open surgery. And you see that uh, even when you remove the suture, there are things that happen that we actually don't know. Uh, in this technique, the suture are removed during surgery, coronal suture, lambda suture. And then when you do a CT scan years later, you will see that coronal suture and lambda suture are there again. They are visible on the CT scan. Conversely, in other techniques in which we spare the uh, sutures, they will disappear and you will have a secondary synostosis in a, a significant percentage of them. And some of them will require the compression. So they will need a secondary surgery. Why those cases need a secondary surgery? Is this related to the technique? Is this related to the patient? This is still something that we don't know. Another series, 79 patients undergoing an extended street craniectomy. So again, what is exactly the extended street craniectomy compared to a, a world remodeling? Young children and during follow-up, almost 10% developing papillidema postoperatively. So what is the difference with the natural history of the scaphocephaly? We know that non-operated scaphocephaly have a risk around 10-15% of the cases to develop raised ICP. So is this different from the natural history? Is this technique changing the prognosis and the natural history of these children? This is something that needs to be considered. And so, of course. It's obvious a long follow-up is mandatory. So if you're the description of the technique, you will see it's one, two, three years. It's not long enough to understand what is going on from a functional point of view. And this is something that is obvious when you study the development of these children, when you see all the review that there are available. We have some data on the uh, functional results, and we know that there can be mild, but still pers present, 
problems in children with uh, uh, scaphocephaly. This is found also in other type of switch, of course, but in sagittal synostosis, the learning disability can occur despite the surgical treatment. And you see that it really depends on the different series that you can read, but all of them agree that there is a, a number of children which will have problems during the, uh, their development. And the older they are, the higher the risk of having uh, res uh, bad results uh, when you do your testing. Can we modify these results? This, of course, is part of the question about the indication of our surgery. And when you see the uh, IQ tests that are done in children with uh, scaphocephaly, you see that there are differences, for example, according to the age in which the surgery is done. Of course, why the surgery is delayed in the second case and one is done early in the first case are a matter of debate, and this has been a, dis a long discussion since the publication of these uh, results, but still there is the evidence that different result, functional results can occur, and this was also found in a more recent paper in which the uh, IQ studies were different according to the age at surgery, suggesting that the earlier the surgery, uh, the better the results. So apparently, different neuropsychological outcomes do exist. And so we have to question what we can do to offer the, to the, our patient the better possible results. In the same paper, uh, the uh, authors uh, found that the volcanoplasty was associated with better outcomes. So again, suggesting that the type of surgery has an impact on the outcome. Of course, because the type of surgery is also related to the age of the surgery, the things are also uh, probably uh, not so easy to distinguish. But, uh, of course, we know, we tend to not think that strip craniectomies in the, at six months of age uh, cannot be as efficient as a wall bolt craniplasty, but this still needs to be confirmed. This is another study to show you the effect of surgery. Remember, Van Velen of series found 9% of papillin after the uh, classical uh, technique they used, and with the spring te uh, assisted technique in the the last communication, Marisa said all the possibility of polyma has decreased significantly the change in the technique. So again, the type of surgery has an impact on the outcome. This is something that we have seen in a different uh, experience. So to summarize, the goal of surgery should not be only to correct the cranial dysmorphia. Of course, we want to correct the, the, the scaphocephalic head, but this is, should not be our main goal. The main goal would should be to achieve the better neuropsychological outcome possible for our children. And so we have to think of which technique will offer, depending on the background, depending on the age, this uh, goal. Again, we need to avoid travelizing the scaphocephaly management. Uh, Craniofacial surgery is not just doing osteotomy. Uh, this is something that all a young resident or all a young surgeon want to start to do because they think, okay, I can do a burr hole, I can do an osteotomy, so I can cure a scaphocephalic patient. Of course, the osteotomy can be done, but the proper osteotomy, the proper management is of the crime so is something different. We need to master the different techniques that are available because we need to tailor it to the child needs, depending on, again on the age, on the type of deformity, on the underlying syndrome and the long multidisciplinary follow-up is mandatory to understand our results. And without analyzing our results, we will not be able to improve our te techniques. Just to uh, anticipate the, oh, sorry. The uh, discussion on the, uh, uh, the, the, the different techniques, you, you know that in the very young one, you can have endoscopic management with good results uh, before, uh, let's say, around three, four months of age. Uh, after, what we usually do is we do a vault remodeling, leaving the, some bone uh, for, for uh, ossification, but with very free uh, around uh, and, uh, without constraint. And where the children are uh, older, we need to uh, fill those gaps, reduce the risk of lacunae, and we have to fixate the, the bone to uh, improve the notification. These are different techniques from that you can need to, in order to which you need to assess the front, 
region, so you and sometimes uh, different cuts on the peripheral region uh, over the sagittal sinus or in older children even leaving the bone over the sagittal sinus because there is no need to free the sagittal sinus after several weeks of encasement. So this is just to show you some of the different techniques you need to master in order to be able to treat the uh, scaphocephaly according to the needs the child has. So I wanted to insist on the fact that there is not only one type of scaphocephaly, there are different types, different patients, and we have to be able to recognize this. And this is the case for all types of synostosis, for the plagiocephaly, for the uh, trigonocephaly, and so on. We really need to move further in the craniofacial world with a better nosological classification to better define the subtypes uh, uh, of the different type of uh, synostosis. At the same time, we need a better definition of the surgical procedures because sometimes we read in a paper, we did an extended strip uh, craniectomy and you don't exactly know what is compared to a volt remodeling that somebody else will do. And when you start discussing with the people, you will see that the nuances are very limited. And in some cases, they are doing the same uh, surgery with different names. And of course, we need to analyze our long-term results. And for that, we need homogeneous series because again, you have seen there are some genes that will affect the uh, cognitive outcome. And of course, if you have in your series two children with uh, uh, smart mutation, the results will be poorer in, and will not depend on the technique, but on the genetic background of these children. This is why for this analysis, the uh, study of the genetic background is mandatory in, uh, in my opinion. And of course, we need objective evaluation methods. I've shown you that just saying, oh, it looks good or to me or to my colleague is not uh, scientific enough to uh, evaluate what are the results of our techniques. We want to know what is going on, not only from aesthetic point of view, but from neuropsychological functioning and probably in the future also considering other type of imaging, uh, anatomical, uh, probably, and functional, but will be useful. And of course, at the end, once we have achieved all that, we will be able to choose the better surgical technique in all the uh, panel uh, that is uh, actually available to achieve the better functional outcome possible for our patient. So with that, I thank you. And I will just to conclude with uh, this sentence, the most dangerous phrase in the language we have always done in this way. Uh, to prone the youngest of you in the audience to start thinking how we can improve the surgical technique and the management of our patient. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Diroko. Um, that was an excellent uh, lecture covering uh, from you know, all aspects uh, and also pulling up uh, many important points that will hopefully expand in the discussion. And also the fact uh, the nice quote about uh, doing what we have been doing. Um, can I please uh, first of all invite uh, Mr. Martin Evans from Birmingham. Uh, Mr. Evans, uh, do you have uh, questions for uh, Prof. Diroko and your thoughts on the points that Prof. Diroko raised? Thanks. Uh, Frederico, thank you. Um, uh, nice talk as always. Um, can I just ask you uh, two questions, if you don't mind? Um, if you think about the, the cohort of patients with delayed intracranial hypertension, when you follow up your patients, are you going on uh, symptomatic kind of signs uh, rather than um, are you, do you have a protocol for ophthalmic follow-up in every scaphocephalic uh, uh, post-op patient, for example, or are you waiting for these signs to come along? No, I do a routine a fundus or in a, um, exam. So they, I routinely go send the children to the ophthalmologist because, uh, okay, I, it's a way also to make understand, the family understand that uh, is not everything has been uh, cured forever. Uh, I, I was, uh, I mean, I was taught by people who were saying to the parents, we do one surgery, the child is cured and there is no need to, for coming back. And now I'm seeing 
uh, this patient coming back in a very limited numbers, of course, uh, as you've seen, but sometimes in very bad condition, like the chi child I told you, uh, who came with, uh, and now he's waiting for a kidney transplantation. So this is the problem of the uh, relationship with the families, in which some cases they, uh, they believe what they're told, oh, everything is cured, so he, if he has headaches, it cannot be a recurrence, he has been cured when he was young. And sometimes things have come uh, several years later, and the relationship between the problem at school or the headaches uh, are not always be done by the families. So this is why I prefer to see them regularly. I, in most of the cases, I see them for nothing because the child is doing fine. There are no complaints, no problem of uh, headaches. But in some times, we have headaches, recurring headaches, and we have uh, fundus that can be problematic in some cases. So the, uh, again, the numbers of these children who are problematic is small. But uh, when you see a lot of children, uh, uh, mathematically, uh, you will see a lot of uh, these uh, things. Like always in surgery, the more you do, the more you will have complications by definition. So, Okay, thank you. And then, so following up from that, if you don't mind, Frederico, and then I'll open it to other um, uh, questions. Um, given the COVID restrictions that we've been placed under in the last 12 months, we are trying to create novel follow-up patterns for some of our patients, video, telephone. Um, where are you taking this in Lyon, for example? Are you? Yes, you know, we had the same problem like everybody else. So the, uh, the, we, the, we developed the uh, outpatient clinic by videos, but there are some uh, standard questions because what we want to know is how the uh, head circumference is growing, how the child is growing, and we want a multi uh, point of view. So what we ask the families to have the, also the feedback of the, the general doctor or the school, because the, the school teacher is uh, very, uh, so, so, uh, it's very active in uh, determining some of the problems these children can have. So we have a school teacher in the hospital, which is in relation with the different school teachers of the different schools. So the, uh, if there are some uh, negative feedbacks from the school, the, uh, they are interrogating the, the school to understand where the problems are, because sometimes the problems are just because the child is not studying. So th there is nothing we can do from a surgical point of view. There are problems of sometimes uh, children that are bullied at the school, and so the results go down. But this, again, is not a problem of the synostosis. And in other cases, there are some uh, fatigability or uh, uh, behavioral problems that hinder the school results. And this having the feedback from the school is essential. So what we try to have in these cases is the, uh, the question to the parents. So. How, do you, how is your child doing? Is uh, like always, is there something different? How things are school? Uh, with eventually the contact with the school and the, uh, when possible, measurements from the head circumference, from the general practitioner or students. Okay, thank you. But of course, having the fundus, it was the same problem during the pandemics because they, they, if they cannot come to our clinic, they cannot go to the ophthalmology. So this problem was the same. Of course, thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Thank you. A um, couple of questions uh, from the chat box uh, before I move to the our panelists. Um, uh, Professor Federico, uh, dear uh, many are interested to know what's your pre-op protocol in terms of do you do uh, genetics, ophthalmology, um, and even neurophysiology preoperatively on all your patients? I know some are too little for neurophysiology, but uh, if they are older. And um, which patients you choose, uh, which you choose for which patient, and um, uh, and in, uh, and in terms of the your own uh, outcome measures. Thanks. I mean, there were lots of questions. Your question. Yeah. So the the uh, we probably forget some. So you uh, please remind me. So the protocol. Sure. Uh, it's well. The, uh, the uh, radiology again 
So we will always say is useless for the diagnosis. We it's a clinical diagnosis, and as a limited, still uh, depending on the numbers of patients, you will increase the chance of having children with other problems. So we had the children with uh, Vadaxin, with arachnoid cyst, with the mal vascular malformations, and so on. And we're happy to have done the imaging, the brain imaging before, just to uh, be sure uh, and to explain to the families that the anomalies were pre-existing to the surgery. I had one case who came to me, the child has been operated in another country, and they came to me uh, to uh, have an explanation why uh, the child had a temporal cyst five years after the surgery, and they wanted uh, the, the mother was sure that they had been problem with the surgery. Federico, can you keep the mic uh, closer, please? Thanks. Yes. Is it close enough? So the, uh, I try to have uh, an imaging. Thanks. I think the imaging is also necessary again for the discussion about the analysis of our results. So all our children go inside the same protocol, which has uh, pre-operative imaging, ideally with an MRI, even if sometimes it can be complicated, especially in the, the young, but uh, or at, at minimum a CT scan. And they all have, uh, go to our neuropsychologist at age three to uh, be able to have a first point age three and then age six and then age 10 in order to have the uh, cognitive results. Uh, and for the same reason, we do a post-op imaging in order to have an objective analysis of the actual osteotomies. But this is for research purposes. Because as I show you, if I call my technique an extended uh, strip craniectomy and an LC, I call uh, a volt craniopathy, we will disagree on the paper, but then when we see what we actually do on a CT scan or a post-op CT scan, we will discover we have done basically the same cuts. So this is the main uh, problem. Uh, also, also the endoscopic uh, strategies. When you see what is removed during endoscopy, uh, in some uh, endoscopists remove only a small part of the strip, and others remove a large part of bone on the superior sagittal sinus and do lateral cuts. So if you remove the sagittal part, you do your lateral cuts with the endoscope or with the H technique, the just the other same. You just cut the sagittal sign of the endoscope. Or put the endoscope and you put your spring. So the comparison should not be done. Federico, we, we can't quite hear you. So. No. Uh, maybe just slightly change the uh, angle of the. No. Hello? Yep. Is it better or not? Yes. Yeah, that's better. Yes. What I was saying is the comparison should not be between the type of surgery. Type of surgery. On the osteotomy, we actually do When we do a spring expansion and you do a pattern of the sagittal sinus and the part of spring, it's very similar to a put an element, which is from an extended connectomy, which is closer to the wall. And this participates. And this Thanks. Thank you. And uh, in terms of ophthalmology and genetics, do you, do you get them before the surgery or do you always, uh, it's know. only after the surgery? Before the surgery, uh, there are, it's, uh, there is no reason to have no reason to have anomalies at the, at the clinical examination for a standard. So it's after it's after one year of surgery. For the, for the we have the results after three months, so it will be after surgery. Thank you. I'll ask, I'll invite Professor Zanen. Professor Zanen, you know, first of all, any questions for Professor D. Rocco and any of your comments from your, your experience and your thoughts? Thank you. 
Thank you, Anari, Thank you, Anari for Anari. this kind of invitation. Uh, it's okay for the sound? Okay. Yes. Yep. Uh, congratulations, yeah. Federico. Always excellent lecture. Uh, very uh, extensive subject, well explained. Uh, I would like to do some comments. Uh, you uh, reaffirm that uh, the indication for scaphocephalic surgery is for trying to uh, improve the neurodevelopment uh, and try to avoid ICP on these patients. Uh, my question is, uh, I don't know, probably in Europe is now so frequent, but we receive children five, three, even ten years old without previous surgery. And uh, with uh, normal neurodevelopment, but bullying at school, uh, they try to avoid to go for uh, scaphocephalic appearance and usually we uh, indicate surgery for this patient to try to improve uh, the morphological appearance too and the opposite my question uh, is in the extreme when you have a premature baby with neuropsychological uh, motor delay and scaphocephalic appearance and confirm scaphocephalic on CT3, on the, the CT scan. And the family asks you, uh, can you improve the development with your surgery for scaphocephalic patients with prematurity and, and neurodevelopment delay? Uh, the indication for me uh, 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 functional for the young one, the young, not the young, the young, the child, you were, uh, of course, if the child comes up, the child comes up, of the Diroko, we can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, We can, you know, it was, it gets, uh, it's, pro it's probably better to have the micro hand, hand, hand microphone, but slightly change the angle or something. We can't hear anything at the moment. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear? Me? I'm sorry. I don't know what happens. Uh, uh, the, uh, the indication in the ten years who is bullied at school, bullied at school, uh, cosmetic. But, but as you know, the you uh, know, correction of the dolicocephaly will not be possible. You can, will not be possible. You can, the uh, skull, the skull, or not normal. You will not be able to reduce the, be able to reduce the diameter. So we are talking about a different type of surgery. This is what that you need to be able, in your armamentarium, to have techniques to techniques to the frontal bone of the frontal bone of the skull. And these are the cases in which sagittal side reading. I don't think there is any reason to try to try. Um, uh, hurting um, uh, hurting at age of 10 when the question is only to improve. question is only to so in these cases I do I what I show the last picture, last picture. Yeah. Yeah. Stay, uh, to enlarge the parietal bones and, the bones mm -hmm. and frontal uh, but this is a cosmetic indication for a, patient, patient, for a particular point of view For the, uh, for the uh, uh, when there is a uh, day, there is a question, and you do the metal day. And by, by analogy, analogy, with other children, with other children, to try and prove there are premature, other delay. This is the same for uh, children, for, uh, children, uh, genetic, uh, anomaly. genetic anomaly. 
you will try to at least solve the problem of the pressure. Pressure. Will be not normal. Will be not normal. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Frederico. Uh, Professor uh, Suha Sudhir Kumar, uh, thank you, Professor Zanin. We'll come back to you again. Professor Suha Sudhir Kumar, uh, uh, do you have any comments, questions for Professor Diroko? Thanks. Suhas. So while we are uh, waiting for Prof. Suhas to connect, um, uh, Mr. Evans, uh, in terms of if you, in your practice, do you, if, if a child gets bullied because of scaphocaphaly due to prematurity, consider um, uh, calvarial remodeling in your practice, or it will be again mainly functional that your indications? No, my indication will be uh, aesthetic at that point. It's, but it's a different. It's a different. It's a different. It's a different from the standard. Uh, from the standard. Uh, Thanks. Um, the other questions. Uh, uh, the few other questions on the chat box. Um, when did you use the? When did you use the endoscope? What angle endoscope did you use? Uh, I use the G and for the uh, stitches, I use okay, great. Uh, and for the age, uh, age I do not do uh, endoscopy if the child is over five, child is over five ideally, it's between three and four. Three and four. Just after four, uh, the point start to lose expensive parents, but maybe spend five years. Yeah, maybe the five years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In my experience. Thanks. Then uh, for the uh, uh, other question. Other question. Uh, uh, so the oldest age. Age. This goes back to the indication. The indication in the indication chart that you, chart you recognize early. early. Uh, so it comes to your clinic at six, to your clinic at six months. months. Is a prevention, prevention problem related to IED, cranial cranial. If it comes age eight, age eight, too late, late, late to prevent to this problem. So if they do not exist, so if they don't exist, the reason to do surgery is only aesthetic. Or like only aesthetic. Or like dead, dead, dead. If it comes at age eight, because eight, as a fixed ICP, like I show you, and this is the case for the metabolic disease, there is there a function. function. So I would so split the indication in free. Indication in free very early for prevention, for prevention of aesthetical and functional problems. problems. And later on, and later on, each Functional, functional, kinetic, kinetic, or aesthetic, or aesthetic plane. Thank you. Uh, uh, just uh, before I ask Professor Udaya Kumar, Professor D. Rocco, um, would you be? A, it might be just the internet connection that's causing the problem for the uh, um, sound. Would you be able to offer your video just to see whether the sound gets better with? Without the video, just to see. You want to see me? Okay. Just, just for a second. <laughs> no worries. Uh, uh, is it better? Is it better? Uh, we'll see with the next question, <laughs> Professor. So, so there, Warren, and do you have to, do you have questions for Professor Diroko? Who has? No, I think today the. Uh, um, any other questions for Prof. Uh, Diroko? The question uh, about the on the age. Yes, on the Hello. age. Hello. 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 Yes. So it's, uh, it's a... no. So I think it's less effective. So I think it's less effective from a technical point of view. The helmet afterwards. Helmet afterwards. And the results are not as good. The results are not as good. That's great. 
Uh, brilliant. Uh, I think um, there are a few more questions on the chat box, Professor Diroko, if you would be kind enough to answer it. Um, and uh, Mr. Evans, uh, can you come on microphone? And I just want to uh, ask you whether you have any more comments for Ms. Professor Diroko before we come to end. Mr. Evans, I think oh, your mic, I'll, I'll get your mic back, sorry. I think uh, Suhas uh, uh, wants to speak now, Naren. Okay, just. Suhas? Yeah, got it. Yeah, got it. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, congrats uh, for the comprehensive talk. Now, I, I had a very basic now, question for you. I mean, uh, you, I mean uh, you write that, uh, that uh, single jersey is not going to do CT scans. When do you initiate a CT scan in the Doricos Sanare? Sorry, there was some background. Sorry, there was some background. The CT the scan. scan do... Yeah, because uh, uh, most of yeah, single sutures we do not initiate a CT scan. Not initiate a CT scan. Yes, this is a, yes. this is what I meant yeah. at the beginning. Yeah, radiological examination. If you just want to do surgery, the radiological examination. Radiological examination are needed in a in research a, plot, research plot, plot in order to understand exactly what that could be the result of what you're doing. So for the for the child is for stuff, child stuff it is not a, it's not a necessary. necessary. But it can be useful because you will see sometimes you uh, will see sometimes uh, uh, some some anomalies some anomalies are indicated. So, so if you do ten K is every is every you will find us some pride. You will find us some pride once every five. Once every five. If you do, if you do uh, uh, cases a year, you will have to go back. So, so the, uh, uh, the diagnosis uh, if you don't need this. If you don't need this. And, um, and um, hello. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, leptocephaly. You know, leptocephaly is a situation where you have scapho along with metopic synostosis. Suppose you have, if you have a very young, uh, young, very young baby, one or two months with leptocephaly, metopic synostosis along with scapho, how do you manage? This is a different type of uh, problem. We, you, I manage it like a, scaphos, uh, like a trigonal because the problem is on the front. You have a real trigonal. You need to assess the forehead. So you wait till the child is older. You do, you do your trigonal cephaly. And you, during the surgery, you will go back to enlarge the, uh, the region and remove the part of the sagittal sinus. And you do some uh, parietal flaps to enlarge. So you will... Uh, remove your strip until the lambda and do some parietal barrel staving to enlarge laterally. And you just need to be careful when you cut Thank your you. temporal parietal region to leave some art part where to stabilize your bondo. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Evans, uh, do you have... Uh, any thoughts at the as final thoughts, uh, um, Mr. Evans and Prof. Zanon? Thanks. Uh, Frederico. Uh, Frederico. Um, um, where do you um, where do you, um, where do you see sagittal synostosis management over the next five and ten years? Um, are we are we reaching saturation point with our uh, multi, multi kind of vector way of, of managing this, you know, springs versus uh, open surgery, dynamic, passive. Uh, where do you think it's going next? 
the problem is where I, I'm, I'm thinking we are going the wrong direction, which is, again, discussing about techniques and not about purposes. So my real question is, do we really need to do surgery in all of the cases? Because, again, uh, the helmet is sufficient to control the shape, much less mor uh, morbid, and maybe it's enough for a subgroup of patients. And others, maybe they need uh, surgery. So again, I wanted to stress the fact that the metabolic uh, folks have told us that the change in shape has no uh, relation with the risk of race SCP. So if we start thinking that shape and race SCP has nothing to, to uh, in common, we, we could imagine everything. We could imagine that those scaphocephalic children with the, with the uh, big deformation actually are the ones who are less prone to raise the SCP because they are protected by the deformation of the head. And those who are less deformed are the ones who are more at risk. And this would explain why when we do the results in the large series, we don't see differences because maybe we are operating the wrong patients. Then, for the wrong reasons. Then there is the question about the... Uh, compression on the sinus and the CSF spaces. Does this increase in CSF spaces play a role? We know that so if the uh, external hydrocephalus is not very good for the brain. So maybe this subgroup of patients is more in need of a surgery than those who don't have this problem. So I think that we should really start focusing on why we do the surgery, starting to uh, forget all the studies that have done in the past, because in the past we had 15, 20 people who, uh, percent who had problems. These problems probably were due to genetic conditions that were not understood by other types of synostosis that were not recognized on the x-rays and so on. So we have lots of things that we need to, to study. And this is why, again, the radiology is necessary in order to have a proper classification of our patient. And the problem is that the solution of this will come only by the analysis of big groups, big groups of patients. So we need large cohort of patients that we will be able to study screening for genetic condition, because of course, again, if there is a condition that explains the deficit, is not the skull alone, is the gene. So we need people without genetic mutation, with only a simple standard scaphocephaly, operated on at a certain age, without a other confounding factor, I did surgery at age 10 or age 4 and so on, and with a similar technique. And I don't care if I put the endoscope or I put the spring, as far as I know which osteotomy was done and which opening I could achieve. Because if I achieve it with the endoscope, with the distractor, with the spring, there is no reason it would change from the functional point of view. Then, when we know that we need to achieve enlargement, uh, let's say two centimeters in two months, we can discuss which is the best technique, less morbid, to achieve two centimeters in two months. But now we're discussing on the wrong parameters and taking the, the problem from the wrong point of view. I will always be able to show you that my cut is better than yours. This is. Uh, but at the end, uh, how is the child doing? And this is what is, impo is important for the patient. Yes, Martin. Mike, Mike for Martin. No. Martin, can... Mark. Yes, I, okay. Frederico, thank you. Um, so the difficulty we've got, of course, and I, and I take everything that you've just said about, you know, we, we sometimes in surgery get fixated with the surgical outcome versus, the, you know, uh, the uh, functional outcome. We just have to wait too long to um, to change the direction of our, our um, surgical technique, though, don't we? If we... 
if we're assuming our children you know reach their developmental potential in their teenage years this is a false problem look at oncology oncology now we know there are 12 subtypes of medulloblastoma so we we are uh, intelligent enough to understand that these subtypes exist and then you know that your outcome of a medulloblastoma you will see in 10 years you, I, if I give you my results of medulloblastoma surgery after three months, one year, you will say, okay, but we need to know what is the follow-up at five, ten years. So this is the mentality we need to know. Survival rates at ten years. So what is the outcome at ten years? We do this technique, and what are the results in ten years? And then we can discuss. The problem is that... Uh, it's not like the oncology, we do open a protocol, we close the protocol, and when we open again the envelopes 10 years later and we see who is alive, who is dead, very easy, it's white or black. In our cases, it's a shade of gray. And we uh, it's, have difficulties, because we, in 10 years we change ourselves, the techniques, we do not do the same uh, every day. So this is where we need to have large series in order to have a good assessment and if the answer will be in five years okay i i'm willing to wait for five years to have a good results that working for 10 uh doing the same thing without knowing exactly what we're doing thank you uh, may i share some experience uh, in Sao Paulo, we have the extreme uh, management of scaphocephalic patients. We have some colleagues uh, just seeing uh, neonates and indicate just after some weeks, uh, like urgent surgery, and some other colleagues seeing the patients that no indication for scaphocephalic patients, no indication for surgery. And in the middle, uh, we have neurosurgeons working by uh, themselves without craniofacial team together. And I think we need to discuss that the better results uh, is uh, when we work together. We share the experience and we learn with uh, the plastic surgeon and they learn with us. Uh, I think it's not reality for all the countries, but it's uh, a goal that we need to look at. Uh, one final comment, uh, Federico. Uh, did you see some place uh, to do a prospective study uh, considering that in some countries you have uh, genetic studies, you have neuropsychological evaluation, and in some others, you don't have this kind of tool to deal with these patients. Did you see some possibilities uh, to try to uh, do a prospective in five, ten years, try to see what's uh, going on at the end of the day? So it's very uh, so we try in France it's very complicated. So first of the comment on the collaboration of course collaboration is essential. I would put radiologists, genetists, and so on. All the team must be represented, and I profit to thank all my colleagues. But we still have to remember that it's a neurosurgical issue, and there is a tendency to leave um, the field to maxillofacial. And this is why all the techniques that have been designed are basically considering only the aesthetic component. And again, this is why we have only aesthetical analysis and criteria, which for me, coming from a uh, social uh, country, are uh, completely nonsense. So I don't care if I spend 10,000 euros or 12,000 euros, even if statistically it's different, if the 12,000 cure is better. Uh, so it's the same. If the result at the end is better, I don't. Uh, there is no discussion about length of stay. The child can stay five more days in the hospital if the result is better. So this is again. It's like if you uh, if to go back to the tumor. I do just a biopsy. It stays uh, one day. It costs less. Yes, but it's not cure. So. We really need to focus on the indication. This is why we neurosurgeons need to be there because we take care of uh, this uh, neurocognitive part much more commonly than the maxillofacial do. And they will see things from a different point of view. 
So this is for the uh, neurosurgery remains uh, essential in scaphocephaly. Then for the prospective study, as I was saying, which we are trying to have one in France, it's very complicated because the uh, methodologies and statisticians, they would like us to randomize for each patient the day of surgery in each center, which means that you tell the parents, your child will have a surgery, we randomize it, we go in the operative room, we toss the coin, and we decide what surgery we do, which you can understand from a statistical point of view, it's perfect. From an ethical point of view and from a surgical point of view, it's much more complicated. And we try to convince them that we should compare different course of patients with different strategies, but it's very, very complicated. And what we did is that we centralized the genetic testing. So in one lab in, uh, in France, we re received the blood uh, from all the different uh, 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 groups. And we are trying to develop some kind of uh, simplified uh, neuropsychological testing that can be done on the internet. So the parents with the child will uh, take the, uh, answer the questionnaires uh, on the internet, so wherever they are, the, the response are sent to a pool of neuropsychologists who will do the analysis and will send them back to the doctor. And so at that point, they, uh, the results should be uh, more homogeneous. At least the analysis should be homogeneous. So this is the trick we're doing because of, even in France, there are centers where the neuropsychologist is not available as, as easy or the genetic tests are not available. So this is why centralization and uh, uh, putting together, and this is again, something we developed like Martin said, because of the COVID, the child could not come to see the psychologist and we start to develop this online questionnaire so that the, uh, there would be no loss of chance. Uh, that was the neuropsychological tests that are done are the classical developmental tools that are uh, given by the psychologists that depending on the age, the WESL, the WISPs, WISP, and all these other strange acronyms they use. Uh, and you, but the problem is that if you do uh, multinational study, you will need to add them in all the languages. And this will increase the complexity of the analysis. But uh, Brazil is very large. You can have in Portuguese uh, the same test given to all the different centers in Portugal and analyze, and this will give you already the uh, good results. But the problem, again, is that you need to be sure that the surgery that is too is similar, or what is the difference with the surgery that uh, Eduard or Yuka or whatever other uh, uh, who Roberto Tudi does in other places, because maybe you call them with the same name and they are different, or maybe you think they're different, they actually are the same. And this is again something going back to Martin's question that I think will need to be developed in next year a kind of atlas in which we call technique A, A, B, C. And you will say, oh, I did A, I did B, I did C. And with a better description than just extended strict craniectomy, because now it's, uh, the trend is to do extended strict craniectomy. I don't know nobody who does not extended strict craniectomy. So if you go for a craniectomy and you say, oh, you're doing craniectomy. Yes, but it's an extended one, everybody. And then you don't know what they are doing. Thank you. Uh, just a final question from me, if that's okay. Uh, in terms of uh, having a registry rather than a, a randomized study, would that be useful? We have it for hydrocephalus, we have it for... Yes, having, in UK. having a registry is, uh, could be useful. This is one way to go. But the problem is that registry is very complex because we need to have a, the uh, post-op examination. So we need to have a very early post-op exam to be sure to we know exactly. And ideally, a post-op CT scan. And as you know, uh, half of the surgeon will say, I don't want to scan my patient. But if we, again, if we want to move forward, we will need to scan at least one generation of scaphocephaly to have the results in 10 years. So we will be able not to scan them anymore, but at a certain point we will need. So 
we will need to scan, have a post-op scan, to have a genetic testing, to have a neuropsychological testing three years after, at least, uh, ideally, 10 years after your surgery. So it, you see that the uh, energy you need for this registry is enormous because you need to be sure that you have pre-op pictures, uh, ideally also a pre-op exam, uh, exam to know where we were starting from, uh, post-op, uh, peer peer up data to know if there were problems during the surgery, uh, post op uh, exam, and a late follow up picture of the child, post op CT scan to know uh, ossification and other things that how they go, and the neuropsychological testing, genetic testing, and fundus. So it's uh, with OCT if we want to be modern. So there are a lot of examination and it's very uh, expensive. But if we have this. At the end, we can say with this type of craniectomy, these are the results we can expect. These are the type of problems in ossification, delay ossification, uh, lacune, or without lacune, or recurrences. What are the neuropsychological results? And then we will be able to answer to the famous question, can we really improve the results of our children? Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Frederico Iroko. I think we have had a fantastic lecture, fantastic discussions. Um, I think we can carry on with these discussions. Um, uh, I think we know each other well. Uh, so I, it, it gives me, first of all, thanks to all the attendees um, from around the world who came to this meeting. And uh, I think the craniosynostosis uh, might be very specialized. A few of us might do, but only it, it um, uh, catches the imagination of... Uh, certainly residents and many neurosurgeons and we had a we had a quite a record number of registrations uh, and many of them could come but the recordings will be there so they can flow it we had over 350 registration for a, uh, a lecture on uh, sagittal craniosynostosis, sources which shows how much interest around the world and how much unmet in, unmet services there i also wish to thank uh, the, um, Udaya Kumaran from India, Professor Dhanan from Brazil, and Prof. Mr. Evans from Birmingham for joining us and uh, uh, contributing to a very informative discussion. And finally, thank you very much, Prof. Federico Di Rocco, for this excellent talk and for your time you. and for discussions. Thank you, and bye look bye. forward to seeing you again in the next meeting. Thank Thanks you. Bye-bye. Thank, bye. thank you, Naren, for the organization. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.